you sitting down and uh, and talking to us. And I think uh, so. Your story is um, similar to a lot of people and very different in a lot of ways. Um, but around the part where you're getting going in life and growing up in the house and and you know talking about your dad building in the late seventies and starting small. Um, I've got to imagine that was a pretty interesting household and experience to grow up in and be exposed to boat building at such a young age. But was there any particular memory or, or times that you have stand out when growing up in a household uh, boat builder? Well, sure. Um, you know, none of them seemed like a big deal at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the most memorable was, you know, he, when he started, he built them under our home. And um, I'd come back from school. I was in elementary school. I hop off the bus and there's no stairs. To go up, he'd had to take the wall out to get the boat out from underneath the house. So that that was one of my my earliest <laughs> memories yeah. of boats being built at home. Uh, another time he had set one up that was actually under our porch, and I had uh, decided I was going to pilfer with it, and I knocked the whole thing down. Mm-hmm. And I never did that again. Yeah, it was not a uh, not a good thing to do. Um, then of course there's um, that's my phone. There's times when you're when he was drawing boats, and it's just a bat and mm-hmm. a sheet of paper and his imagination mm-hmm. and the scale rolling. Mm-hmm. He would call you in there to hey, you, you either, either hide, he's going to hold the bat and we're going to mm-hmm. describe it for him or vice versa. Mm-hmm. And, um, Did you find yourself sketching a lot as a kid, like? I, well, well yeah, I used to like to draw, mm-hmm. but you know, drawing and actually um, designing something to scale and function mm-hmm. is two mm-hmm. totally different things, but. Um, sure. Which your your wife showed me that uh, your little one could put us all to shame. I think. Um, my fourteen year old, yes, most definitely. That's uh, no joke there. Yeah, she's she's pretty talented. Mm-hmm. She is. Mm-hmm. So growing up, was it a uh, regular job for you as a kid, or were you just out running around playing, or what was? No, um, I didn't start in the boat shop until actually my senior year of high school. Um, every other summer, I was either. Uh, my dad built me a skiff when I was 12, and so my first summer jobs was crab potting out of that skiff. Mm-hmm. Um, did that for two or three summers, then uh, long netting, which uh, is kind of a, a lost art in North Carolina today, but a um, couple of summers doing that, um, yeah. making little charter boats, and just just living in, living in Dare County. Yeah. You know, did a little bit of everything. Of course, played baseball in the summer, and that was just... Um, you know, one of one of the things that I, I guess is unique here that I didn't realize, I, I just thought everybody grew up with a skiff. I, I didn't know that uh, most people did not. When I got home from school, me and my friends, that's all we did. We all had boats, so we all jumped in a boat and off we went. And until shortly after dark when we finally decided to come home. Yeah. That was a normal day. Um, was it a lot of kids of... of- even builders now as you fast forward or was it um i mean are there a lot of contingents of folks that you grew up with that are still here locally that you keep in touch with or are they spread out naturally like no, mo- most of my childhood friends are still here mm-hmm. um, pretty- yeah majority of them all yeah i mean this community and and i know we've talked about it before but this community is just wild to me how everyone is i mean you're right here mm-hmm. right we're all connected mm-hmm. um in one way or another, we're all pretty much connected. Mm-hmm. Um, pretty tight, tight knit group community. I suspect down to Moorhead's the same way, and mm-hmm. various other places. But yeah, it's just well, part of living in Dare County. I mean, even in some areas, and I'm sure it's like this in, in Florida and Moorhead and a lot of other places. But I think you just have so many builders that uh, also have a, a lot of very strong reputation for building really solid boats. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I think we're. You know, we're spoiled. I'm spoiled. I get to come here and vacation here and yeah. come talk to you and, and have so many people with, you know, a great craft in one place, which I guess as far as like, you know, even hands on today and, and I'm going to bounce around a little bit, but uh, when you find folks to work in the craftsmen and the laborers that are working on your boats today, has that been a hard task to find people that you feel confident in or do you normally end up? Um, I, I, I believe that you hire for, um, for attitude and commitment, and you train for skills. 
Um, I've tried it the other way around, mm -hmm. and a lot of times with the skills comes attitude. And I would rather have someone that is um, passionate about what they do, that they care yeah. you know, about the end result, but they care about the customer mm -hmm. as well. Um, I don't have to worry about them as much. Mm -hmm. Well, they're building a recce boat, right? They are, but they're also representing themselves as well. I mean, yes, they're representing me. That's why I have them here. Um, but ultimately, wherever they walk, they're representing themselves too. Mm -hmm. And they, I, I want them to know that. You know, they don't just uh, don't just show up at eight and leave at five, and that's the end of the story. Um, it's it's kind of got their name on it too. But but, but yeah, labor has always has always been. Um, I won't say difficult. It's always been a um, well, yeah. I guess difficult is the right word. Uh, we only have 30, 37,000 year round residents here. Well, it's not always sunshine and rainbows in any business, though, right? It's not. I mean, it's, you are building something that it seems like every single inch is looked at. It is. And, and people... That wasn't the way in the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, they got away with a lot more. Uh, no question. Yeah. Well, it's technology. These cameras, all that fun stuff makes yeah, that, you know, technology and different. budgets, and it's just each, each person, not just in Dare County or uh, Carteret or mm -hmm. Stewart or wherever else you go, but everybody kind of feeds off everybody else. Mm -hmm. and everybody wants to one up the next mm -hmm. guy. Um, and I, truthfully, I think that's what drives mm -hmm. the innovation. Um, Do you think, I mean, I, and I know baseball and sports in general probably created a little bit of the competitive bug in you, but was there anything else that you think drove some of the competitiveness out in you that you see today when you're even building boats? Mm -hmm. or? No, because it's one and the same. I mean, that's just kind of my nature. Mm -hmm. Just um, wired in. Yeah, I think you're supposed to always have a little bit of a chip on your shoulder. Mm -hmm. um, you don't necessarily use attitude with it, but um, it should always be there. You know, I've, I've been doing this. I started with my dad in 92. So we're going on almost 30 years, mm -hmm. but I still feel like the, the new kid. Yeah. Um, so. And that was that was ninety two, so fresh out of school, fresh out of college, yeah. and and baseball wasn't possible. Shoulder, right? Yeah, I mean everybody comes to an end at some yeah. point. Yeah. And you come over here, and what? I mean, all hands on deck, right? You're doing a little bit of everything. You're doing a little bit of everything. You know, back then we were a much smaller group, mm -hmm. um, and my dad really there wasn't an office position. Yeah. And he had the only office position, and, and quite frankly, he wasn't in it a lot. Um, so yeah, it was, was there something on, on the floor with a, a saw, a grinder, a hammer. You know, back then, it wasn't quite as much screws. It was, it was a little bit different, but. Part that was your favorite to you, as far as building process goes? I, I, I still really, my fondest memories are working with my dad, and he would create the drawing. Um, I would assist a little bit, but it was, he created it. And um, when it came the time when he would just send me in the shop with the drawing, and you're starting with a rough stack of lumber, and then you started to see it materialize. It was like watching a butterfly. And to me, that was the art of it. Mm -hmm. um, it isn't quite the same today, because that, that process is now done on a computer, which is still cool to me. Mm -hmm. But it's not, you know, it's not the same. I was younger then too, so yep. it's, yeah, you know, um, most things when you're younger have a different memory. What do you get yeah. drawn to today in the process? What's that? What what aspect of the build do you get drawn to today? Are, are there aspects? I still from... enjoy that. I enjoy that the creation of it. Yeah. Um, and that's primarily where what my function is. Um, once once it's created, uh, I, you know, I endeavor to empower my guys to create what or to fulfill what we've created. Um, it still requires some of me, but not like, certainly not like that was. Um, so in the creation phase, because I gotta imagine it's, you know, getting plans down, sitting across the table from somebody, a customer, a potential customer, sure. and, and getting feel for them and what they're looking for. Sure. But where do you turn for, for inspirations or, or what is, is there a particular place that's driving you to say, hey, these are cool ideas, or do you think that more so comes from the customer, or what's? Mm, I, I would say it's a collaboration of both, but 
primarily we're all feeding off of each other. Mm -hmm. And everybody sees what the other guy did, um, whether it's in person or on the internet. I mean, there's no, there are no secrets. Mm -hmm. um, Especially I mean, if, you try, if there is a, well, I mean, there may be a secret for several months, but that's that's about the lifespan of mm -hmm. it. Somebody else is already one up in you by the end. I mean, that's just the nature of it. Um, that's why I say budgets drive more of that than anything, because not everybody can have everything they see on the internet yeah. or that they see on the other boats, but they. They can certainly give their twist to it, and it makes everybody better, I think. But so when when someone's sitting back and looking on the web at all of their options that are out there, I mean, what do you think are the things you're hearing that are the difference for why they come and work with you and talk to you versus uh, someone else? You know, that's um, I had three gentlemen in here yesterday from the Northeast, and they asked me the same question, and I don't know if I can give you one answer. I don't, I don't really know the answer to that question. I'm not in every other yard. I don't know how all of them function as a culture. Um, I do know that the captains and crews that come here generally have been to other yards and they do comment how things are different. Mm -hmm. And that's really all I can do. And I can't tell you exactly what that is. Uh, hopefully it's because we treat, we try to treat people with respect and mm -hmm. as equals and you know, well, we're, uh, in the, in the end, the customer and I and our, um, our crew are really on the same team. And I do think at some places that there is a adversarial uh, relationship between the customer and the, the mm -hmm. builder, and that yeah. shouldn't be. Yeah. Um, we all ultimately want the best product. Uh, we want it, it's got our name on it, we're proud of it. The owner has put their hard earned money and their thoughts and dreams into it too. You know, we're, we're all shooting for the same goal, yeah. I hope. Yeah. And um, I, I, I would like to think everybody feels that way, but I, I can't answer that. For sure. I think, I mean, obviously I'm not building a boat with you, but I think one of the things that I noticed right away from even our first interaction and, and, and with Sarah and the rest of the team was just that culture of everyone's having fun. It is a family. Like it, it feels like somewhere you can go and it's a very safe place and, and um, you're all doing something really neat. And I was, it was kind of crazy. I was reading Marlin Magazine and I, I have the note here, but um, owner Sally Girl said that building the boat with you and Sarah was like becoming a part of your family. And I've got to imagine that's one hell of a compliment, you know, yeah, to hear. It is, no doubt about it. Probably something that helps yourself. You yeah, I spent way too. 30 minutes on the phone with one of our, uh, not, he's not a current customer, I guess you'd say. He was one of our last boats. And uh, our conversation wasn't about boats at all. It was about hunting and you know, just life in general. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, when you work with somebody for two plus years, uh, you, you hope that the end is as good as the beginning. The beginning is always good. Mm -hmm. um, you know, everybody starts out on the right foot. Um, I just want, want it to always end on the right foot. Um, that's, that's important to me. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess the boats that you guys have built have evolved over time, right? There's the history um, and the focus area. Can you talk a little bit about the transition from maybe where your dad started the boat building business off and kind of where you see it going today and where you're trying to make changes and tweaks and emphasize the good things? Well, obviously I had the benefit of starting off where he left off. Um, I also worked beside him for 20 years and I saw things that worked, I saw things that didn't work and whatever else, but you know, when my dad started, it was a completely different era. Um, it, my father really didn't have a father. Mm. He didn't have someone to teach him. Um, he didn't have a bank account to help him. And he was a commercial fisherman and he needed a boat. And that's pretty much how he started. He built, his, he built it for himself so he could provide for his family. And then uh, before he had finished the first one, another commercial fisherman asked him, hey, can I, I'd like to buy it. And he said, not not till after the summer, um, but come back next fall and you know we'll talk about it. So the guy did, he bought it, and my dad built himself another one. And that's, that's how he started. Um, my dad was always penny conscious because he, he grew up with not much. Yeah. Um, wouldn't say he was poor or poverty, but he, you know, he did, certainly didn't have excess. And um, so that was always kind of his mindset. And that's how, it's really a lot of, the, a lot of how he 
did so well is because he didn't over um, extend himself. And when times got tough, he could weather the storm. Um, whereas some folks would not be able to do it because they, they hadn't saved any money. You know, yeah. they'd spend it all. That's a good life. That's not, his, that's not his nature, mm -hmm. you know. So, you know, when he, when he began, it was an entirely different time. Um, and he began with entirely different customers. I think most of his most of his first customers were probably the same age, so they didn't necessarily have the highest of budgets, but they had they wanted a boat, so they figured out a way to do it. And uh, I always said about about my dad, he was the he, he had the ability to make complex things simple, and a boat is a really complex thing, mm -hmm. but really it is simple, and I learned that from him. Um, he didn't. He, the, he didn't get messed up with the forest for the trees, but but conversely, I could go show him something simple, and he'd make that complicated. Mm -hmm. And I always I always picked on him yeah. about that. I'm like, come on, man. But anyway, it was. Uh, you talk about your dad a lot. He's, I mean, the well, biggest impact in your life. Oh, uh, no question. Yeah. Um, you know, there there are other influences for sure, but I wouldn't be doing what I am today if it hadn't been for him. Um, and quite honestly, if he was, had been easier on me, I don't know if I'd be doing what I am today. Um, when, when he retired eight years ago, there was no backflow of work mm -hmm. or nothing waiting on the, on the table. There was, he didn't leave any money in the account. Yep. Um, it was pretty much, here's what it is, I'm done, good luck. Mm -hmm. uh, pretty much take what you've learned and apply it. Yeah. And at the time, it didn't feel good, um, but I do think it helped me immensely. Mm -hmm. um, it also helped humble me quite a bit. Um, you know, it, you can always question why somebody does something mm -hmm. um, until you're the one doing it. And, okay. then, and then you think about it a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think that's true. It, it's true in business. It's true in life, too. Sure. Like, you know, having kids, there's no playbook on how to run <laughs> no. that show, right? You know, every every kid is different. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I I still I, I feel like in life in general there are certain there's a moral compass you go by, and I think if you treat people with respect, yeah. um, and you and you are trying to become be a person of integrity and trust, that it'll work in any aspect, whether it's raising kids or building boats, and that's mm -hmm. that's kind of how I see things. That's my lens. So the time comes and, and you get the opportunity to put your stamp on things. What's kind of the first, second, third thing that you looked at to say this is? Well, the, f the first thing you have to remember is we were always plank on frame. And um, we had butted our heads against that wall for a long time. And um, there's really two reasons that I stopped doing it that way. The first one was a business decision. Well, actually, they're both business decisions. One was that wasn't what the market wanted. Mm -hmm. um, and second of all, I did not feel like I could be, I didn't have another me. So I couldn't put somebody on the floor building a boat and then ha answering the phone and running the business. Um, I was, I guess it was probably the last boat that my dad and I built together, the 74, was in the shop. and. Um, we were faring and planking it, and I was supposed to get on a plane that afternoon to fly to Pensacola, Florida to measure for a mezzanine. Well, I'm, I'm on the stage with, with a cell phone in one pocket, the shop phone clipped to the other one, a grinder in my hand and a mask on. And every time I'd have to stop and put that, take that mask off and put the grinder down to answer the phone, the other five guys beside me had to stop. And when I got on that plane, and my brother was with me, I said, I will not do this for the next 20 years of my life. And that, at that point, I already knew I had to do it different. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was kind of an easy decision at that point. I'm sure there's ups and downs within the mechanism, but was there ever a time where you said, boat building might not be my thing and I want to go explore something else? Um, no, I can't say that. When I got out of college, um, I liked fish. Um, I charter fished while I was in college. My, uh, all my buddies fished. And when I got out of college, they continued to do it and they traveled. They spent three months in Venezuela and three months in uh, um, Islam Harris and they'd spend mm -hmm. time in the Bahamas and all this. I'm still here. And they're making three or four times what I am. At that time, I made the commitment that this is what I was going to do. 
I mean, I knew from from that time that's what I was going to do, and I had to kind of add that you got to pay your dues. That's how I felt, mm -hmm. and I, that's what I did. It wasn't and always the, it wasn't always the easiest decision for me. Um, I like to hunt, and my buddies, when it's the weather is bad, the hunting is good. So they had a day off when the weather was bad. I didn't. We're perfect. I still had to go to the boat shop, and uh, so sometimes it was, sometimes I wished I was doing something else. But but my um, my goal, my purpose had always been. I think it worked out all right for you, right? Take it a couple had, of days to go hunting now. It has so far. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's not. It's still not always peaches and cream, mm -hmm. but um, it's okay. Do you have any uh, favorite catch or fish uh, or hunting trips that? Well, probably probably the most. I mean, I've had a lot of them, but probably my most memorable rem memorable was with my nephew in a boat builders tournament, and he caught a spearfish, and I I thought that was pretty cool. Um, I never caught a spearfish. I'm not gonna say they're um, that they're rare here, but they're certainly not an everyday occurrence. Do you remember how old he was? He was. Um, well, it's not a bad place to start. He had been 13. It's 12 or 13. He had had a double lung transplant the year before. Wow. So that, that's why it was it was all of those things. It was on the eye roller, which was the last boat I built with my dad. It was just it was just a very memorable yeah. trip. Um, still my favorite fishing is I still love tuna fishing. Um, always have. Mm -hmm. uh, but you mentioned fun fishing over tournament fishing. Yeah, I'm, I'm not, um, you know, obviously I'm happy that a lot of people like the tournament fish. It, it's really not my mm -hmm. cup of tea. Um, I don't necessarily like large crowds. It's not that I don't like people, I just don't like large crowds. Um, if it's, um, it, I think it forces people to fish on days that they really would rather be doing something else. Mm -hmm. And I'm no different. Um, uh, maybe I'm ADD or whatever, but if I fish for a couple of hours and I haven't had a bite, I'm ready to look for something else. Mm -hmm. And that's something else. It can be dolphin versus tuna or bottom fishing or whatever it is. If you're fishing a tournament, all those options are out. Yeah. So that so that's my reason mm -hmm. for it. When I go fishing, I want to go catch, and you know whatever increases your chances of catching something mm -hmm. is what I want to be doing. Yeah. And. Uh, which, do you have a favorite tournament you go to? I mean, I know they're not your favorite. My, my, thing, my, my favorite and where, where, kind of where my heart is is, is definitely the, um, our, our custom tournament here. Um, but the Boat Builders Tournament yeah. here. Um, I'm, I'm a part of it to some degree. And um, obviously it represents our community. And each year we're, we're able as a group to give, I think this year it was about $74,000 in scholarships to area high school kids. That's awesome. And and that's that's something I personally get to see. I know there's other tournaments that do a lot of great things. I just mm -hmm. um, well, it's right here in your know, backyard. Know, it's in my backyard. It's, it's yeah. kind of personal to me. Um, what about bouncing around a little bit to eye roller? So I I've got to imagine that was a bittersweet boat to build, and that is a gorgeous boat to build, but. Uh, Last one with your dad? Yeah, we didn't necessarily know that at that time. Oh, you did? Okay. Not really. Um, not when we began. Mm -hmm. Obviously, uh, the Great Recession had begun um, shortly after we started the boat. And I think that was sort of a catalyst for my dad. Mm -hmm. He was 62 years old. Yeah. Um, I think he recognized that plank on frame was going to be more difficult to sell. Um, and at that time, I was four, almost 40. And uh, there really wasn't room for both of us at the same time. I'm not, not saying there wasn't room, but yeah. uh, it's difficult in a small shop to feed two families yeah. at the same time. So you put in some he thought it was a good time. Yeah. <laughs> he, yeah. Thought, he just thought it was a good time. Yeah. Um, put in some dues by then. Yeah, sure. Found your sure. When you think about legacy of Scarborough, what, do you, what resonates when you hear those sorts of conversations come up? I, you know, I, or with you, I, I can't. I can't tell you that I give it that much thought. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I, every day I go, I'm just trying to make a living. You know, I want it to last as long as it can. Um, I want to do it right so that it does last. Mm -hmm. uh, I am very proud that we've been 
uh, or that my father and I have been in business for 40 years. Um, not many builders can say that. Mm -hmm. um, there's been a lot, of, a lot of builders come and go in that 40 year time span. Um, and and hope, hopefully we haven't just uh, endured, but we've continued to be relevant. Um, when our boats are no longer relevant, they're no longer fresh, they're no longer uh, catch people's eye, then it's time to quit. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think has been your favorite change you've seen over those 40 years in just this community and space as a whole? Um, well, I, I, you know, I don't know. I, I, I might need to present the question to me a little different. I don't know what you're asking. Maybe around, I mean, specific to the boats, let's say. So, I mean, the introduction of technology has obviously done a crazy amount of difference. I mean, you know, ski, sea keeper on what it's done oh, to the boat, yes. and then the, the yeah. technology from the electronics and all those things has been pretty wild to see. But is there anything within the boat building yourself? Well, uh, you know, obviously engines have had a great deal of impact on boats. Yeah. Um, yes, sea keepers, yes, uh, instruments and all the other things, mm -hmm. but, but horsepower in general mm -hmm. um, in a power plant that wasn't too heavy and bulky has driven the size of boats. I don't think, and, and also budgets. But man has always wanted bigger and better. You know, nobody goes, nobody downsizes. Of course not. And not, not and be happy with it. So I think man is always trying to do something faster, bigger, better than the last one they did. And I think horsepower has been the catalyst for that. Uh, the other stuff is icing on the cake. Um, the sea keepers, and they certainly make things more comfortable. Um, um, electronics has made everybody, um, everybody's navigation skills have gotten better. You know what I mean? That's, mm -hmm. it's, and I'm for anything that makes boating safer, more enjoyable, more pleasurable for whether it be a family or a professional captain, whatever whatever it is, I'm, I'm in favor of it. Which who, who do you typically see working with you the most? Is it um, a particular, I'm going to say stereotype, but it, is there a particular type of customer that you find you enjoy working with the most or that you end up tending to get matched with? Well, we seem, for, for whatever reason, we seem to attract more um, younger families. Um, which I like, I can relate well. Um, but as far as what they're all, they come from all walks of life. Of course, you know, it's it's always interesting to me to sit down and hear how they made a living and where their success came from, because mm -hmm. obviously they're all successful. Um, and um, is there a particular customer that stretched you a little bit further than maybe you normally would have been stretched? Well, sure. But, but by and large, and even my dad would say the same thing, his 30 some years of it, we have been blessed with some very good customers. Okay. Um, there's always some that are more difficult than others, but you know, <laughs> another statement my dad used to make was when we, when we have the boat builders tournament, we have a night called boat builders night. Mm -hmm. And all of the area boat builders, whether they're pr present current builders or have in the past, they all show up, we do a photo shoot and, it's just a neat time together. Mm -hmm. my, my dad says it's the customers we ought to be honoring tonight, and, and it's absolute truth. Because um, we, it doesn't matter how much uh, passion we have or how many ideas we have, if there's not a customer to help fund it, mm -hmm. um, it doesn't happen. Yeah. Um, Which I, I guess in that building process, there's so much unknown, and you're talking about a two-year building process, so mm -hmm. the world can change in two years. Mm -hmm. a piece of technology can yes. change. <laughs> Um, I, I, you know, then again, this theme today is just going to be technology, I guess. Which is I, well, very I, fitting, I, but. I, mean, I love technology. I mean, we've uh, obviously in the last eight years we've gone from blank on frame and a sketch on a piece of paper um, to beginning with the sketch on a piece of paper to a 3D, well, a wireframe, then a 3D mm -hmm. model, um, and we're diving into other aspects of. Um, performance um, predictions and things like that mm -hmm. um, and then all of that what for me what makes all that come complete are CNC equipment which I have uh, two of those um, and it seems like every about every other week we're figuring out something else we can do um, with those technologies 
and, uh, and to me that's exciting it makes it mm-hmm. exciting it also extends the um, the working life of all of us as we get a little older um, yeah. well, I've got to imagine that extra precision and efficiency and time helps life a lot more too it, it does no, no question it has its growing pains as well mm-hmm. um, and um, and, and figure I, I, I do believe there is a balance between um, the way things used to be done mm-hmm. and the way we're doing them now you know we'll find some places where the CNC equipment fits perfectly well doing this um, CNC equipment would do the other thing good but isn't necessary because a man can go in there and do it yeah. maybe it'll even a little quicker um, you just, it's just finding that balance not falling in love with either with either tool mm-hmm. Um, what about the f- future for builders as a whole? I mean, and I think we've talked about this a little bit before, but it seemed like there was that wave, and I think it just naturally happens because that's the way people story tell and they wrap things together. But you had this wave of builders like Buddy and Ami, Ami and, and all these folks, you know, mm-hmm. back in the day. Yeah. And then you have the second wave and now we're, we're on almost like this third wave of, of builders that are happening and for the guy that's sitting there that might be building in his garage today or is thinking about diving into this crazy world that you live in I mean do you have any thoughts or advice or things do you think about that much at all and what the future of boat building is going to look like um, well obviously we're, I'm always thinking of where it's going to be in three to five years yeah who knows where we'll be 20 years from now mm-hmm. um, I, I, just like the the, the uh, 3D printing and I don't really know what there is out beyond that. Mm-hmm. Um, we we haven't really even touched that hardly in the boat building. Yeah, it's a whole another whole, that whole like another animal altogether. So, so, I, so I don't know what it'll yeah. look like 20 years from now. I I really don't. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, what I do know is it's, it's it, that's what makes life interesting. Mm-hmm. And, do you see um, many? Do many people uh, approach you for advice or? Uh, insight in uh, builds well yeah occasionally I, I, I do think um, there are some folks that for whatever reason would be intimidated to come here because we've been here so long mm-hmm. and think that whatever it is they're doing is insignificant which mm-hmm. I don't like I said I feel like the new kid on the block too mm-hmm. um, but you know by and large I think boat builders don't mind helping other boat builders um, somebody had to help me, Omi helped my dad, um, you know, BC, Omi Tiller, my dad, my buddy Davis, Erwin Forbes, I could give you a whole litany of them that fed off of each other. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Omi used to say that if uh, one man didn't copy the other, we'd all still be, you know, canoe. Mm-hmm. You know, you're always feeding, each one's always feeding off the other. And, um, you know, one of the probably one of the most helpful people I know in the industry is Roy Merritt. I've never met a more generous person with his um, with his ideas um, than him. Mm-hmm. And I and I and I know others in the area would say the same thing. So if someone asked me, I've, if I was uh, if I withheld information or wouldn't share it, I think I would be a hypocrite. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I wouldn't do that. Yeah. What about? Uh you know, you put the hammer down, so to speak, and done with this. What do you think? What do you think comes in your days of retirement? You ever think about that? I have you? no idea. So you're no. still right in the thick of things. Yeah, I don't. I, you know, I don't know if we're made to retire. Um, I'd agree with that. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think there comes a time when we're no longer relevant. Mm-hmm. But as far as retiring, I just think you move on to another mm-hmm. chapter. And, Keep going. Now I'm saying that, and I'm not 50 yet. Mm-hmm. I might say something different when I'm yeah. 60 or 65. But your dad's so, still sneaking over here. And he does occasionally. Yeah. yeah, he does. He does. But um, I, yeah, I don't know what retirement looks like. I, I don't really see that as um, that's not a goal I'm looking for. Mm-hmm. Um, probably in the latter years, I I would like to spend more time being able to go. See, th- see places and mm-hmm. see things, but but still never. You have any bucket lists? Fully quit. Well, I got lots of bucket lists. Places you want to go? New Zealand, Argentina. Which did you see that uh, monster 
they just pulled up, mm-hmm. 1,400 pounds. 1,480, I do believe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That, that was actually in Australia. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah the guy that, um, the captain of the 67 that's in here right now, he's from Australia. So he's very excited about that. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, that's... yeah, I mean, the world's a big place. Mm-hmm. I live in a real small chunk of it. Mm-hmm. I'm sure you get, I mean, you spoiled a little bit. I'm sure you get to travel a little bit to be able to go and either meet prospective I could, customers. I could be. Yeah. I, I could, but you know, at this point in time, I still have to be here. Mm-hmm. Um, but having said that, I enjoy being here. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's not, uh, to me, it's not drudgery. It's not, um, I don't get up in the morning and go, gosh, I got to go to work today. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I get up pretty excited that I get to do what I do every day. You know, it's not a, it's not drudgery to me. That's good. So that's, I, and I guess that's why retirement isn't something I think about. Mm-hmm. For one thing, it's a ways off. Of course it is. I think it's, you know, I ask the question in the sense of just, it's interesting to see how far out people are also looking in their path and their, mm-hmm. I mean, I've had struggles with it too, where I sit there and, and figure out, you know, what am I going to do? Where am I going to spend my time? Yeah. And, and what am I going to focus or what goal am I going to hit? Um, and it's fun to hear. I mean, I'm, I'm a planner and a thinker. Mm-hmm. One of my favorite words is eventually, but mm-hmm. sometimes you got to figure out that eventually is today. And, and live for today. Is there anything you would have done differently along the way? Uh, yeah, uh, for sure. Um, but I don't know if I'd be the same guy I am now if I had. Mm-hmm. Um, I would have probably been a little more, um, a little more. I won't say serious, but a little more uh, involved in the business end. Um, because truly, that's the most difficult side of it. Building mm-hmm. boats is not hard. Mm-hmm. The business side is. Or, or it's more difficult. Yeah. Um, and there's no playbook for that either. Because I don't do anything like what my dad did. Mm-hmm. So. Different world for sure. Well, well, I I mean, I can't thank you enough again to sit down and talk with us for a little bit. And um, I think, you know, your story is obviously one that's very unique in its own right. And you guys do build some gorgeous boats. So. We try. Thank you for sharing that with me, and I'm sure we'll be back in town. Yeah, again. you like to fish. Yeah, we have a few of those around here. So. Yeah, I do. So, but perfect. Well, I, I appreciate it, and we'll um, we'll take this and we'll take see the if, footage. See if it worked this time. See if it worked this okay. time. Right. Make the magic happen. Good deal. And, I think you uh, just wanted an excuse to come down. Yeah, get another. I haven't taken this thing off my head in like okay. two weeks since I've had it. Pretty, oh, God, pretty sure. Me. You can, yeah. Yeah, you can turn That's this good. off. Um, well, you, you want me to keep one? No. Yeah, he loves the camera. You keep it on all day long. Uh,